my uncle and I are visiting the California State Railroad Museum in Sacramento, California to take a guided tour and learn more about cool trains like this. That's coming up next. Once that tunnel was done, there was a mad rush to get across the Nevada Desert into Utah. Into Utah. And the Union Pacific was building out from, from Omaha, and they were trying to get, get into Utah as fast as possible, too. They were both trying to get to Salt Lake City, because that was the only large population area between California and the Missouri River. Whoever got there first got, got most of the business for it. Well, they were in such a hurry that you had survey teams pass each other over 20 miles. They didn't care, they were being paid, of course, based on the number of miles of track that they laid, and the bonds that they sent. The government did, though, once they found out about it, said, no, you can't, we can't have double trackage, we're not going to pay for that. You've got to pick a time and a place. So they picked Promontory, Utah, to, uh, to meet, and they set the date for the 8th of May, 1869. Governor Stanford takes off, and he gets there, and there's nobody to meet him. So a telegram from the Union Pacific saying we're going to be one or two days late. The Union Pacific business train was coming out of the uh, northeast corner of, of uh, <coughs> Utah, heading towards Salt Lake City. The train comes around the corner, and here is a huge pile of railroad ties blocking the tracks. And it's called tie contracts. So this an individual went out, cut down the trees, hand shaped the ties, and sold them to the Union Pacific. So that worked fine for them except the Union Pacific hadn't paid these guys for about three months or so. Between them about $200,000, which was quite a lot of money at that time. So they decided they were going to stop the train and ask for their back pay. Well, <laughs> they didn't have enough cash on them for anything like that, so they had that telegraph wire running pretty hot and heavy for a day so <laughs> trying to find a source. They found a source that kept the guys happy, except where the money was coming from, so they released the train. So the ceremony was two days late on the 10th of May. But when Governor Stafford left here, he left here with a bunch of spikes and things to, as part of enjoying the real ceremony. <laughs> Mainly he had a gold spike representing California, a silver spike representing Nevada. And we guess uh, a friend of his made the golden spike for the, for the governor of San Francisco. And we guess that friend just wanted to have a duplicate of what was going to be used in the ceremony. So he actually had two spikes made identically at the same time, engraved with the names of the principals. And, uh, the first one was heard dated the 8th of May, given to the governor, he went off to the, uh, uh, <coughs> to the ceremony, and when they finished up the second spike, by then it was really going to be delayed by two days, so it was dated the 10th of May. And then it disappeared from history. It wasn't a historian one at all, and then they even knew there was a second spike. It was identical to the first one, except for the date. Until about 12 years ago, a relative of a friend decided to auction off the antiquities did. So the foundation that funds a lot of our acquisitions is able, able to buy that. We have a drop down safe on the other side of the store. So they have a ceremony and everything else. These are all copies of the original photographs made. You notice I mentioned that, that we had about 10 to 12,000 Chinese working for the railroad. And the Union Pacific also used local Indian labor doing the same thing. But if you take a look at all these photographs, you don't see any Indians in there and no. No Chinese whatsoever. So <coughs> by that sp gold spike, there was a great big painting that was painted in the 1880s, and the guy took out just a license to correct history with it. So he's got some Indians and some, some uh, uh, Chinese people in the pictures. Then he, he took one step further and started putting people in there at the press of Governor Stanford uh, that went there. Judah was in there. But he'd been dead for a few years. <laughs> C.P. Huntings is in there, but he went back and watched in D.C. trying to raise money for an extension for the Southern Pacific that was going on. And it added a few other people in there, too. Okay, now, the rest of the museum you're going to be seeing railroad equipment. 
like this piece of equipment here. This is original. Everything in here is, is original equipment. It's been restored to its earliest known, known date and the color, the color schemes, the, the whole nine yards that have. These are beautifully wood, wooden uh, passenger cars. This is a first class car and they used a, a, a pot belly stove in the front for heating. So, so in first class, in the winter time, whoever got the closer you got to the heater, the more, more important you were, you were I guess. In the summer, the farther in away the from summer, the heater? It was just the yeah, opposite. <laughs> yeah, First thing you have the heater on, the most, for the most part. But a lot of things we take for granted, uh, we still, uh, <coughs> we, don't, we didn't start off with, of course. Um, all these cars in this area here and locomotives are all. Uh, 1870, 1880, 1890 vintage pieces. Now, early on, we didn't have air brakes. Everything was braked by hand. Even though uh, a patent for air brakes had been filed in 1863, <coughs> railroads wouldn't adopt things unless they're told to by the federal government. But they have to. So they don't really go with new innovations and, and until the government says, yes, you will. And so it was. It was a long time before air brakes became mandatory. So long, for a long, long time, it was all done by hand. Local, the engineer and locomotive with his whistle would signal set brakes, and brakemen would come up, usually from, from overhead, drop down, start setting the brakes. Now, if this was a, a, a freight car, the, the wall comes right here, and this brake would actually be extended all the way up over the top so it would come down. Working for the railroad was very, very dangerous. <laughs> Historians say uh, that working in a, in a early railroad yard is the same thing as, as uh, a soldier in the middle of a battle. The same injuries repeated day after day after day were occurring. Give me an idea, if you want to make up a train <coughs> with these two cars, locomotives down that way, he knows I'm here and he's slowly pushing this car towards me and I've got to guide this link into that receiver and drop the pin in. Pin links, and that was it. Metal couplers weren't made, made mandatory until, until after, after the, the uh, uh, after 1900. So, so if I misjudge the speed of that car coming towards me, or if the locomotive pick up the last minute, the bolt boiler sort of goes out a little bit too much, <laughs> too much steam, anything like that. Now I got a hand down here. I can use fingers, hands. I can, you, somebody could holler at me at the last minute. I'm down here and I turn around like that. Catch a knee, those kinds of things over and over and over again. But when the Southern Pacific started uh, taking over the operations of the Central Pacific, they realized they were losing a lot of uh, experienced people that could be repaired and put back to work again. So they started building their own hospital system, medical system. They had a hospital here in Sacramento, there was two in San Francisco, almost a rehab center, and then they had clinics up and down the valley where the railroad Down here. We'll start off with this car here. This was a start off as a business car. It was built in the, in the 1890s on the Georgia Northern Railroad and went it was sold to other railroads over, over a period of years and eventually became a private car owned by two travel riders based out of Carson City, Nevada. And when they wanted to be on site someplace, say they had a, they wanted to do something about the Liberia Tarkets for a magazine, something like that, down in LA. They contact the, the regular railroads to pick them up in Carson City, take them down to LA, put them in the nearest railroad yard where they wanted to be. We want the power and water, and they were all set. They had their own man servant and their own, own cook to take care of everything uh, they needed. We still have private cars today. Um, you'll see them on, on the uh, on the back end of, of an Amtrak passenger train. Sometimes, sometimes you'll see them just being pulled by a locomotive by, by themselves because they're going to some kind of convention. Uh, they, they have conventions about once a year in different parts of the country. So, but it's a night in New York. If you want to, it's a nice way to travel. It's expensive, but it's a nice way to drive. 
Anyway, all the living, the living quarters are down this way, bedroom, uh, regular uh, uh, dining room here, kitchen facilities on the other side. Um, <coughs> you can't go inside the car, but there's a great platform on the other side. The windows are all open so you can take a look inside. Then you're going to head towards our uh, refrigerated car. That's an early version of refrigerated cars. It's really with horse hair. There's blocks of ice that were, that were carved out of the uh, ice up in the Sierra Lakes. And <coughs> this is what really made California agriculture. This allows us to get our fruits and vegetables out of the state to go anywhere in the United States and eventually the rest of the world. It's so important to the agriculture to give you an idea. The shipping year of 1999-2000, the <coughs> value of the fruits and vegetables taken out of refrigerated cars exceeded all the estimated gold ever taken out of the Sierras. One, sh one shipping year. That's, that's the kind of imp impact our agriculture has. You go inside that car and see if there's a big map in there showing you where it draws, where they draw from to uh, the food pack and everything else, and how where the ice goes and that kind of thing. They're going to head towards the silver car. On the other side of the silver car, there is a Canadian Northern sleeper car with the Coleman sleeper specifications. It's mocked up and it's rocking back and forth over your field for going down the railroad. And uh, it's slightly darker, so you see the flashing lights of you, like you go past the railroad crossing. You see, you hear the noise of the locomotive and everything else. And you see the makeup from the day chairs to, to, the, uh, to the beds. And take a close look at those beds because they're made for two people. Very close to the accommodation. People are a lot smaller <laughs> back then. There's a dose in there, and then there's a dose in the next car. You go across, there's a platform to connect to the uh, dining car, which is the silver car here. That's the Pachiti. That's part of a first class train that the super cheap. It went from LA to Chicago. 39 and a half hours, only made four stops initially. This is how the politicians and the people from Hollywood got back and forth close to the Very high end first class. Now, a lot of the railroads had, uh, had high end first class trains on, the, on their systems. And they marketed their uh, passenger service based on the reputation and the quality of the food and the service in their dining cars. And so they wanted to make sure the presentation was fine. So this is a nice piece of China. So we have we have examples of China for all the major railroads in the United States and stuff. And they're going to come out and hit towards our F7 diesel, uh, diesel electric locomotive. Uh, they started building these in 1939 and war interrupted the production. And as soon as the war was over, they started making them again. And they couldn't sell them fast enough. The railroads discovered that this was strong, this and uh, similar type of uh, locomotives were strong enough to start replacing steam. And it also cut their maintenance costs by more than 50% of over, over steam. So they won this right away. The sides were off to give you an idea of, of how it actually functioned. You've got a diesel engine that drives a generator and the generator drives electric motors that actually drive, drive, uh, drive the wheels on them. Uh, right here, the 4466, this is a yard goat. Uh, switch is actually a, uh, it's a switch engine. And uh, it just worked, worked in, the, in, in the yards, breaking and breaking down the uh, trains all the time. This is built in the 1920s. Over here, this is a mock up of high speed trains that are running over in Europe. Uh, that's a really nice way to travel. They travel up to 220 miles an hour normally. They've done some test runs, they're up to 325. Right. <coughs> I've ridden on a couple of them. That's a really nice way to go. Against the wall, uh, you see the, the orange and brown car, number 42 over there. It's a railway post office car. Uh, RPOs were, were, were how uh, mail got across the country out in all different directions. from. Towards the uh, end of the Civil War, all the way up until 1966 and regionally until 1977. It's a fully functional post office, you can do anything any, any post office can, can do as you go along. There's a ghost in there and you can show you how they pick that mail when they buy small towns at 70 miles an hour and go get the mail and, and deliver it. And they're going to head towards their cab four. You see the people up on the ramp over here. You can go inside that cab. It's with its tenure, goes from here all the way get back against the car wall. Weighs over a million pounds. C.P. Huntington was the first locomotive bought by the Central Pacific. And okay. I mean the Southern Pacific. Okay. Now, what's really funny is the cab forward mm. is the last steam engine owned, built and, and owned by the Southern Pacific. 
And right across the way is the C.B. CB Huntington, the is, is, is the very first one. Um, you know, if you read the thing that it says powered is powered by coal, this really was a wood burner. But they cut down so many trees for the railroad, for mining, and for building bridges, all that kind of stuff. They basically denuded the hills. All, if you see any pictures of Truckee around uh, 1900s, 1910, I mean, you see a you see a one lone tree here and a lone tree there. The rest is just been their cut. So they didn't have enough. This they just used this as a, as a switch engine. They didn't have enough wood to keep it powered, so they had to convert it to converted coal. <laughs> that's an ecology yeah. lesson. Yeah, lesson in real time. So. And this actually was really funny. This was saved from the World War One. World War II from being drunk. The workers in, in, the, in the local motor works across the way hit it. So when they were looking for scrap to sell off the work and the things, they, they said it. They, they were, somebody knew that was a piece of history of that. Right. And how that how they got saved. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day. Well, thank you everyone so much for coming with my uncle and I to the California State Railroad Museum. So awesome to come here again to see all the awesome trains, as well as to take a guided tour and learn even more about the Transcontinental Railroad history and how it is connected to California. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please consider subscribing to my channel because each and every day post videos like this, and you wouldn't want to miss out on any of it. Until next time, this is History Month 14 Fun Book signing out. I'm indeed happy. A blast from the past.